afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Conversations in Education on WCEG Network. I am your host, Vincent Cheeks, and let me be the first to say, if you haven't heard it already, happy spring to everyone. It's a new season, new beginning, new time of year. So we want to keep looking forward, keep looking to the sky and moving forward in 2022. Today, we have another mentally stimulating show for you all today. I have two authors on the show. We're going to welcome them right now. Uh, please help me welcome Ms. Marty Rosner and Mr. Fry Gellyard to Conversations in Education. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Good. Good Vincent. Fine. Excellent. 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 Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm going to give you all each individual a little, a little bit more opening time and give a little bit about your background. So I'm going to start with you, Marty. Uh, you were a teacher and educator for 43 years, correct? Mm-hmm. You don't awesome. quit. Once you start, you don't ever quit. <laughs> now, that's, that is definitely the mentality of a true teacher. Uh, it says you, ret you retired in 2018, correct? Yes. Okay, so awesome to you for 43 years of excellent service in our communities. Uh, I see you also served as the district literacy and social studies coach serving Title I schools in Cobb County. Correct. Excellent. And you were the current, are you were or you are the current curriculum consultant for Sundance New Bridge, which is an educational publishing company. I did that previously. Previously, all right. And since you've retired, you are currently working in some capacity as a reading tutor. That's correct. Okay, Where do you, what school do you do that at? Hollydale Elementary. Um, it's a K-5 Title I school and um, mostly Hispanic students. Okay. Um, and a lot of them are struggling because of pandemic and, you know, having been at Ooh. home and on video and, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm getting that from a couple of the schools that I, I partner with with my nonprofit. Oh, well, if, if a family only has one computer and they've got three children in school, it's kind of difficult. Yeah, yeah, that's that's unfortunate. Um, yeah. But I'm sure you're doing awesome works and, and doing the best you can to get them caught up. That's exactly right. I'm doing the best I can. I know you are. <laughs> um, and, and we definitely appreciate you that. So thank you. And before I move on to Fry, I just want to, you know how there's a saying now that says uh, we should give people their flowers when they're alive. Right. You know, what that means, you yeah. know, most people, you know, heat praise and gratitude upon people once they transition or passed on. And sure. we like to do that when people are alive. So from me to you, I would <laughs> like to give you your flowers because you've been such a blessing to me from the moment that we've met. From the moment you met. Do, do you remember where we met? We met, we met at the Hope Global Forum. We met at the Hope <laughs> Global Forum. And for those of you who've been following the show. Uh, Hope Operation Hope is one of the organizations that I volunteer with. Uh, I volunteer with them to teach financial literacy and youth entrepreneurship uh, to youth. And so because I volunteer with them, this is how volunteerism pays off. Because yes. I volunteer with the organization, they give me free passes to come to the Hope Global Forum, which is a huge uh, cross-country and I want to say international um, uh business forum where people come from all across the world and country to meet and network other business professionals. And so that's where I happened to meet uh, the lovely Ms. Rosner. We were sitting at the same table. I had come in late because uh, I was trying to find parking. And I don't know if you remember, I came in and I was complaining about the, well, I used the wrong word when I said it. I was complaining about the exuberant prices for parking and you <laughs> being the teacher that you are you corrected me and you were like uh, i'm not really sure if that's the word you want to use and i said something about the prices being high and you were like no it's not exuberant it's exorbitant okay it's exorbitant is the word you want to use for the ridiculous prices for the parking and i'm sitting there and i was like well who does this woman think she is <laughs> Correcting me. <laughs> but you know what? The more I thought about it, and later I found out you were a teacher, but the more I thought about it, I was like, she was, she, it was bold, it was hip, but more than anything else, it was correct. 
<laughs> Absolutely <laughs> correct. Because exuberant means being lively or full of energy. Mm -hmm. And exorbitant means highly priced <laughs> or unreasonably highly and it was <laughs> you are absolutely correct in your assertion so i appreciate you in that and I, I wanted to tell that story to highlight the fact that great teachers never stop teaching no matter what the <laughs> circumstance <laughs> and also to highlight the fact that great students never stop learning no matter how old they are and i said something like that if i'm not mistaken <laughs> Correct. And so I, I just wanted to let you know that I appreciate that moment <laughs> that I share with you. And I appreciate your friendship and you even, even from the moment we met, you've been one of the biggest supporters of my nonprofit, uh, Alchemy yeah. Artists and Inc. Donating time, donating supplies, donating books. And so thank you for that, uh, Marty. It is greatly appreciated. I greatly appreciate you. So well, I appreciate you and the work you do too. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so, very much. But this is not the Marty and Vince show. No, <laughs> it is not. <laughs> <laughs> we have another guest here, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Friedel Yard. Sir, welcome to the show, Conversation and Education. Thank you very much. Glad to be with you. Sir, yes, sir. Thank you. Now, I got to have to take in a deep breath to read off all of your accomplishments, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Yard. So just bear with me, everyone. Okay, then we're going to get to why we're really here, which is to promote this book. Ezra wants to know the true story of the Rosenwald School. Can you see that? Will I see that? Okay. So my other guest is Mr. Fry Gailyard. He is a writer in residence at the University of South Alabama. Excellent. I'll, I'll let you explain to our audience what that means in one second. Um, he is the author of more than 30 books. Okay, I'm going to say that one more time. He is the author of more than 30 books. Okay, so he might know a little something. He might have a little <laughs> intelligence up there, a little knowledge he wants to share with you. Uh, his books explore themes of social justice, Southern music, religion, politics, and culture. Three of his books have been adapted as public television documentaries, and he, is con and he has co-authored the script for two of those, including the Emmy-winning In the Path of the Storms. His critically praised book his critically praised books have included A Hard Rain, A, A Hard Rain, America in the 1960s, an NPR Great Read of 2018, and winner of X, F. Scott Fitzgerald Museum Literacy Prize, Cradle of Freedom, Alabama and the Movement that Changed America, winner of the Lillian Smith Book Award, The Dream Long Deferred, the landmark struggle for desegregation in Charlotte, North Carolina, for which he received the NAACP Legal Defense Fund Humanitarian of the Year Award and Watermelon Wine, the Spirit of Country Music, which is featured in the Country Music Hall of Fame. <gasps> okay, and Rethink. that's just a, right. fraction, a fraction of his accomplishments and accolades and awards. So thank you, Mr. Fry Gailyard, for being here also. No, thanks for having me. It's great. Great oh, yes, to get sir. a chance to talk about this stuff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So before we get into the book, uh, I asked you before the show, because I was curious, so I'm sure I have questions, other people have questions. Uh, what exactly is the residence, uh, writer in residence at the University of South Alabama? Well, the job description is that I, um, I teach uh, usually one class a semester, um, and I work with uh, individual students on their writing, um, and then I do my own writing, um, okay. and I also do like uh, events where I go out and talk about um, things that we hope matter. Um, to, you know, to public groups. So it's kind of part of the university's outreach. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, when Marty and I go out to talk about um, our new book for young readers, um, you know, that falls under the broad umbrella of my job. And so that, okay. that means I don't get in trouble when I'm out on the road. <laughs> when you play hooky from school? Yeah, when I play <laughs> hooky from the big school, yeah, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, that's excellent. And again, I'm very impressed with this more than 30 books that you have authored. Is that all of them on the shelf behind you? Uh, <laughs> no, some other people wrote some of those. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, you do it long enough and the numbers mount up, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm an old guy. Vince. <laughs> old and wise, I must say. That's where all those 30, 30 books of knowledge and wisdom come from. Um, yeah. Thanks. So now I know, you know, all of your books are your babies. And as parents, we always say we don't have a favorite child. But do you have any particular book that is your favorite or that stands out of that you would just like to recommend to our listening audience? Well, you know, most of what I write has been uh, for, you know, in this context, since Marty and I are talking about a children's book, I'd say most of what I write is for grownups, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so... Um, you know, one book, uh, A Hard Rain, America in the 1960s, uh, looks at the that pivotal decade in our history. And, uh, you know, it's uh, a lot going on, a lot going on. And it's yeah. uh, and the book is is uh, accordingly very thick. And, uh, you know, it's a good doorstop if you can't read the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, and I have a new one out now that I uh, co-authored with uh, Cynthia Tucker, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who okay. was at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, um, who's now a journalist in residence here at South Alabama. And it is called The Southernization of America, A Story of Democracy and the Balance. And it's kind of a reflection on our current political moment. It's just out. And uh, so we're doing some interviews about that. But the interesting thing is uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Marty and I are, are old friends, uh, having known each other uh, back when she was a teacher in Charlotte, but we kind of reconnected and we've been trying to write uh, for young readers uh, telling historical stories uh, and uh, along the the uh, the theme of teaching hard history through stories of inspiration. Okay. And so we've done a couple of books together. And, uh, you know, for me, it's been a, a wonderful addition to, you know, to to what's now a fairly long career. I, I've okay. really enjoyed reaching out to younger readers, not only the writing, but also visiting schools. And uh, Marty and I have done a lot of that. Yeah, we have okay. fun doing that. Awesome, awesome. Sounds like a great partnership. So um, <clears throat> bring you back in here, Marty. How how did the partnership between, he? because he just mentioned you all have been friends for a while, but how did the partnership start to write this wonderful book that you guys have written? It, it's not showing up on my screen when I put it up, but it's, but it's how Ezra wants to know the true story of the Rosen Wild School. Um, well, we reconnected. Um, he had come into town to talk about his book, um, Letters, A Journey to the Wilderness. And it was family letters and things like that of um, people in his family and so forth. So I went to see him and... Um, then he came back to Atlanta to speak at the History Center about a, a young, uh, young readers, like um, middle school readers. Okay. Uh, he had written a book, an oral history book that he can tell you more about. It was called Go South to Freedom. And I went to see him there and I said, you know, we should write a book together. And what'd you say to me, Fry? <laughs> I said, okay. And I said, what? <laughs> really? Really? So um, we, yeah, we, he had some ideas about stories and we started getting together about once a month and, and working. So that's what we've been doing for the past couple of years. Okay. Awesome. And uh, Mr. Gail Yard, what was the inspiration for Ezra wants to know the true story of the road? Rosenwald Rosen School. Well, the the uh, just the Rosenwald story. Uh, a lot of people know it, and a lot of people don't. Um, I do not. Um, but basically, uh, near the beginning of the 20th century, so in the early 1900s, Julius Rosenwald, who was the president of Sears Roebuck, uh, okay. back when Sears Roebuck first developed the catalog 
that they use to market their uh, merchandise nationwide. And um, and so in a way, Sears was like the first Amazon, you know, right. Um, and, <laughs> and they had the catalog. And, and so Sears began to make a lot of money. And as president, Julius Rosenwald began to make a lot of money personally, a massive personal fortune. Um, he, he was a man of, of Jewish descent, the, the uh, son of, of Jewish immigrants uh, to the United States or, or grandson. And, um, and he wanted, he, he had a very well uh, developed sense of, of social justice, of ethics. Okay. Um, and he wanted to do something with his money that would be of benefit, particularly to African Americans. He saw a parallel between the uh, oppression of Jews in parts of Europe, uh, even going well back well before the Holocaust, mm -hmm. uh, and the oppression of African Americans in the United States. And so he read Up From Slavery, the, the uh, autobiography of Booker T. Washington. Okay. And so he and his rabbi got on a train in Chicago. His rabbi was named Emil Hirsch, and they, he, they, he was a big proponent of social justice also. And they took the train from Chicago to Tuskegee, Alabama, where Booker T. Washington was president of Tuskegee Institute. And basically, yeah. Rosenwald said, what can I do? And Washington said, we need schools. We need schools, particularly in rural areas for African-American children. Whoops, sorry, my phone, I thought it was off and it's not. Um, so we need, uh, we need schools for African-American children. And so um, over the next 20 years with seed money from Julius Rosenwald, uh, they built uh, more than 5,000 schools for okay. African-American children across the South. So it was really a history-making kind of, it was a great piece of, great story of philanthropy. And so, so you know, it, it was a case of, uh, of Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald, Washington's vision, Rosenwald's seed money, but also all these African-American communities in a little places all across the South bought into this idea. They wanted something better for their children. So they stepped up, uh, helped with the building of the schools, raised money to support it, um, to, su you know, to support this, this opportunity for their kids. And, um, and as Julian Bond said, it was a, uh, it was a path breaking thing for, um, and some of the people who went to Rosenwald schools include people like John Lewis, Maya Angelou and others. So it was John uh, Lewis from Georgia, John Lewis? From Georgia. Well, yeah, the Congressman John Lewis. He grew up in, a, in rural Alabama yeah. and, uh, and went to a Rosenwald school there. But uh, yeah. So anyway, it's a, it's a great story. And we thought um, young readers would like to know. And uh, Marty, you might want to explain how we sort of approached it. Well, um, you know, we thought about it and um, my inspiration, part of my inspiration uh, were my grandkids, Eliana and Princeton, um, uh -huh. because they are, you know, their dad and one set of grandparents are African-American and I'm Jewish, okay. which Julius Rosenwald was Jewish. And I feel like it's really important for them to know all of their history. They need to know the Jewish mm -hmm. side and they need to know the African-American side because it's not yeah. just... A religious thing it's a cultural thing and I want them to understand both cultures not so much the religions they'll get that but the cultures are different and um and the parallels between the two I felt you know they I needed to tell it from the eyes of a child and I thought who better to tell it than a grandmother so they were the inspiration for the character of Ezra okay um, and, um, Ezra in Hebrew means helper okay. and he is, he's very curious, but he is also a helper, you know, he helps his grandmother and grandma helps him. Um, and I just felt like the name joy, you know, he loves grandma and she brings him a lot of joy. So I thought that was a good name for her, but, um, 
Julius was raised um, with two very important Jewish tenets. And one was called tzedakah, which is giving and offering. And the other is tikkun olam, which is Hebrew for basically making the world a better place. So he was, he was sort of taught the, um, you give a man a fish and he can eat for a day, but you teach a man to fish and he can eat for a lifetime. Right. Yeah. And um, the partnership that he had with Booker T. Washington really did that. Um, Fry had mentioned that there were over 5,000 schools for children, but some of those schools were training schools for older kids because okay. the elementary schools really ended at eighth grade. And if there was nothing there for them to attend after eighth grade, many of them went back and continued on in eighth grade sort of over again. So um, yeah, one of Booker T. Washington's um, big things was he wanted he wanted African Americans to be self sufficient, to be able to do for themselves, be proud of what they could do. So he wanted each trade: sewing, cooking, baking, industrial things like building. Um, and so that's what those training schools were for. Okay. So, you know, and there were also buildings for teachers because the teachers oftentimes would have to travel long distances to teach okay. at these schools. So some families in these rural communities would take them in, but they also built what they call teacherages for teachers to live in as well. What is it, teacher, teacher or what? And so it's like, a, you know, there's an orphanage for orphans. This was a teacher. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> I, I just know teach, teacher and teacher. I've never heard that word. Teachers live. Yeah, we, we, we hadn't either, but basically it means a place for a teacher to live. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the little book that we've done uh, is divided into two parts. Marty wrote the, uh, the first part. Uh, some people have said she wrote the good part. Uh, but it's a, <laughs> uh, but it's, a, it's a story, you know, of a. Uh, of, uh, a little boy and his grandmother and his, and his grandmother is telling him the story of the Rosenwald schools. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote the second part mostly, although Marty wrote some of it, uh, that's, that's just the basic backstory, the basic history of Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, the building of the schools. Also some of the other things that the Rosenwald fund did, which was support the work of uh, iconic African-American artists, many of them Harlem Renaissance figures, mm -hmm. Langston Hughes, Marian Anderson, uh, Jacob Lawrence, the painter, um, just uh, uh, Horace Mann, the educator, uh, just so it was a, uh, it, he was just an amazing uh, philanthropist who saw beyond his moment in history and uh, really wanted to uh, just provide the kind of uh, modest support that would enable people to do better things. And, and he just did that for the remainder of his life and really beyond because the Rosenwald Fund continued after he died. So that, that history is in the back of the book also, mostly for parents and teachers and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, an inspirational story for us too, as we wrote it. Okay. Um, and you said the, the, it continued, the fund continued for a while after Mr. Rosenwald died, correct? Is it correct. still something that continues to this day or did it eventually die out? Marty, you have, you've always been fascinated by this part of the story. You... Um, it didn't actually die out. What happened was he felt that every has their own challenges and every generation should take care of those challenges. Mm. So he made sure that his fund only lasted as long as his money was there. And then when it ran out, the fund ended. So it was, it was built for that. So the, his generation, that generation of people would be able to 
help themselves become better people, but that the next generation needed to help the next generation. Okay, and so... So the fund, um, the fund ended in, Fry, do you remember the year? It was 1940 something, I believe. I, I think so, yeah, uh, but I can't remember the exact year. It was the late 30s, I think, or early 40s, the fund ran out. So. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, just had a comment typed in saying pay it forward. <laughs> so yeah. I'm yeah. thinking that's uh, yeah. you know, it's kind of the part of the thing people should pay it forward. You know, the that's following right. generations pay it forward to the next following generation. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exactly right. absolutely. Yep. Okay. You know, one of the things that uh, the Rosenwald Fund did, uh, particularly in its later years, was fund the research uh, that some African-American scholars did that became the backbone for the Brown versus Board of Education decision that desegregated okay. schools. So Kenneth Clark uh, and his wife uh, did this research that became very famous. They, they showed two dolls, uh, identical except for the color of their skin, to, okay. to young kids and whether the kids were black or white, um, they generally thought the white doll looked better. Yep. And, um, and uh, so, you know, the, the, as sociologists, the Clarks made the case that this was because of the message of inferiority <laughs> that was just inherent in having uh, separate and, uh, and unequal schools. You know, that myth of separate but equal was never, never the, I mean, it was separate, but they were never equal in terms of the resources that they had, even though they might have some really excellent teachers. But that sense of being set apart in an inferior space, the Clarks thought uh, was, was just inherently bad for kids. So Rosenwald helped underwrite some of that kind of research that led eventually uh, to the case that declared separate and unequal schools to be unconstitutional. Um, the Rosenwald schools that were built in the early part of the 20th century were in fact uh, segregated schools because all schools were basically in right. the South. Uh, but he did help fund the research that led to uh, to changing that reality as well. So, you know, really, really far-sighted guy, decent guy who uh, was always humble about his own work and his own philanthropy. Uh, he he used to say that people. Um, assumed that if you were rich, you must be really smart. And he said that he knew that wasn't true because he was rich, you know? So, I mean, it was pretty, he had a pretty good sense of humor about that. And he yeah. never graduated high school either. His parents I, sent him to New York when he was 16. So he could true. apprentice for his uncles in the clothing business. Okay, he, that's interesting. So how does someone without a high school degree managed to become the president of one of the, what became one of the largest uh, companies in America. Well, first you have to remember the time. And um, I think it was through a, a lot of circumstances and he was very smart. And he, you know, he knew what he was doing. He had a great sense of, um, well, he had a great work ethic, but he also understood manufacturing. He, he understood how to get things out. Like, Fry, you want to, you'd talk about this better than I do. Um, well, he, he figured out, uh, he figured out how to distribute the goods that Sears Roebuck made. Uh, and so he just had that kind of knack to do that, you know, yeah. and, and then he also had family connections uh, that he, um, that he used very astutely uh, in his own rise to the, through the ranks at Sears Roebuck. Um, and so, um, yeah, he was a good, he was just a really good businessman. He just had an instinct for it. His entrepreneurship, the kind of stuff you do, Vincent, you know, where you try to help people, uh, help people learn that he, he had an instinct for it. He had a gift for it and he worked hard. So, um, all of a sudden there he was, uh, you know, sitting atop the 
Sears Roebuck empire. And he could have just said, look at me, look how successful I am. But right. that was, the, but he had the opposite instinct. You know, if, if I'm here and I have this money, then I have the opportunity to do something that's beneficial to other people. And, right. and he felt a, you know, a moral urgency about doing that. Okay. And that goes back to what Marty mentioned very earlier when you were mentioning what was it, Tacon Olam? Is that Tacon right? Olam, mm hmm And what That's was the right. other word? Yeah, helping, mean? well, um, the other one is tzedakah. So tzedakah is like giving. giving. It's not necessarily charity. It is a charity, but it's giving. Giving so other people can have. It's sharing. Right. And, and, and Tacon Tikkun Olam is making the world a better place. Making the, Leave the world better than the way you found it. And and I love that. And I really think, like Fry just mentioned before, that's the responsibility of each generation mm -hmm. is to leave the world a better place. Um, and so it, to me, it's pretty amazing to me, given the time period that this happened in, in um, that this Jewish man had all of this concern and empathy <clears throat> for this community that he really didn't have a connection to. Uh, and, and for me, when I first read the book, I thought that um, he may have had this connection with the black community because, you know, we, black community had slavery, Jewish community had the Holocaust. And I thought that played a role in him feeling empathy towards the black community. But then I realized that the Jewish Holocaust started after mm -hmm. um, this project because uh, this project with Mr. Washington and Mr. Rosenwald started in 1912, 1913, correct? That's right. right. Mm -hmm. correct. But his it, family left Germany because of the pogroms and because of all the anti-Semitism and people being killed and tortured Jews being just because they were Jewish. So that was going on for a long time then. And because mm -hmm. from what I knew about the Holocaust, even in studying for this story I'm doing with you guys, mm -hmm. I always thought the Holocaust was from 1940 to 1946, roughly. But even from what I read during this, it started in 1932, 33. 33, when Hitler became. In the power, right. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know the anti-Semitism started. Okay. Okay. Big. Um, and so when I realized that Mr. Rosenwald's empathy towards the black community was not tied <laughs> to the Jewish Holocaust, then it really made me think more like, well, what was it about this particular man during this particular time with all this chaos and violence and, and uh, racism mm -hmm. that made him step outside of that box to go the extra mile and extend this olive branch to this community uh, that he really didn't know. I mean, well, was it just his upbringing? Was it the, the uh, respect that he had for Mr. Washington? I think it was all of the above, but, but also as Marty said, uh, there, were, there were violent repressions and, and uh, attacks on Jewish citizens in various parts of Europe, in Russia, in Eastern Europe, in Germany, uh, that, that went back long before Adolf Hitler. Hitler just kind of uh, uh, perfected the, if you want to use that as a, in a grisly way, uh, okay. he just perfected the hatred of Jewish people. But it, it it predated him uh, and was often violent. Uh, and mm -hmm. so his own family had been, had seen that kind of violence and had left Germany in part because of that. Okay. So, so he did know about violent attacks on Jews. It was just okay. before the systematic murder of 6 million people in a short amount of time. Okay. But, but he, you know, that was a part of, I think, what made the similarities with the oppression of African-Americans and the oppression of Jews occur mm -hmm. to him is that, wow. he, you know, there had been, you know, terrible things aimed at, at, uh, at Jews uh, in Europe that his family had fled. 
But you put all of that together with the ethics, the Jewish ethics that he was raised with, you know, what us Christians might call the Old Testament uh, teachings, mm -hmm. you know, but um, the uh, just that teaching in the in the great Hebrew tradition that you give and you make the world a better place. And uh, and so he believed that, too. But the specific focus he could identify with uh, with African Americans, and it was just so obvious in those days. You know, mm -hmm. he was coming along. He was he was born in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, he lived not far from where, like a block or two, right, Marty, from mm -hmm. where Abraham Lincoln had lived. Okay. Springfield, Illinois, was the site of a horrible uh, race riot, by which we mean uh, whites randomly attacking African Americans uh, in the early years of the 20th century. It was one of the things that led to the founding of the NAACP by W.B. Du Bois and other people who, so Rosenwald was aware of that because this was in his hometown, you know? Okay. And so, so all of those things just came together in, in the mind of a man who was generous at heart. Well, and you okay. also have to remember that in the beginning of our history, Jewish history, we were slaves in Egypt. Oh, so yes. we were held in bondage as well. And you learn that as Jewish children, when you're coming up, that's what you learn about. So there, there's a long, long history of slavery and, um, you know, and anti-Semitism. So... You're absolutely right. Um, it, it's just an amazing story to me, and I'm glad, I'm so glad <laughs> that uh, you, you brought this to my attention, Marty, because I, I think there, there needs to be more spotlight put on these types of stories, because I know uh, Mr. Rosenwald couldn't be the only man. Maybe he did, he might be the only one that did it as big as he did, but he couldn't have been the only one that was making these types of sacrifices and helping people, being of service to people. And I don't think he felt it was a sacrifice. He to him, a, it was, you know, for him, it was, I'm so glad that I can do this to make the world a better place. It wasn't to sacrifice. He, he planned those things. When he was first starting to make money, um, he wanted... He, he thought, if I can make $15,000, I want $5,000 for my family. And um, what was it? 5,000 for my family, 5,000 to save, and then 5,000 to give. Oh, so okay. he, he, that was, that was him. It wasn't a sacrifice at all. That's, that's pretty magnanimous though, to give a third mm -hmm. of what you make to whoever or whatever organization, like that's pretty, that's pretty big. Um, yes. So, I, I, again, I'm pretty amazed at the story. We are, you're listening to WCEG Network, Conversations and Education. I am your host, Vincent Cheeks. We are on live with Ms. Marty Rosnett and Mr. Fry Gelliard. We're discussing their book, Ezra Wants to Know the True Story of the Rosenwald Schools. Uh, it's a pretty interesting read. Uh, where can people find it? Where can people find the book? It's on Amazon. <clears throat> they can find it on Amazon. Okay. That is exactly where I got my copy from. Ah. <laughs> um, well, that, you know, the but, other thing I was going to say, you were talking about, you know, there must be other examples. And, uh, right. you know, one of the things that, uh, that Marty and I want to do in the, uh, in the work that we do together for young readers is talk about examples, not necessarily just of, uh, of Jewish philanthropists or whatever, but the first book we did together was mm -hmm. about a man who worked to make a better world. Uh, it was, okay. uh, it's a book called The Slave Who Went to Congress. Okay. And it's, a, it's a, the story of the first African-American congressman from Alabama who was elected in 1870 uh, at the beginning of Reconstruction. His name was Benjamin Sterling Turner. Benjamin Sterling Turner was enslaved for the first 40 years of his life. When he um, went during the Civil War, because he had taught himself to read at great personal risk 
because because enslaved people were not allowed to learn to read by right. law in, in the South, but he learned anyway. So he was literate. And when his owner uh, went off to fight for the Confederacy in the Civil War, he left Benjamin Turner to run uh, the most uh, prestigious hotel that the owner was the proprietor of in Selma, okay. Alabama. So Benjamin Turner ran that hotel, ran a livery stable business of his own on the side. And when the war ended, he had about $10,000 that he had saved up. And he used a chunk of it to build the first African-American school uh, in, uh, in the town of Selma, Alabama, the first one that there had ever been. Then he ran for Congress uh, on a platform of racial justice and racial reconciliation. So he okay. had almost like Nelson Mandela sensibilities, you know, all the way back uh, in those days. And, you know, his vision and that of other African-American members of Congress did not carry the day because of, you know, the complexities of history, too much right. racism, too much right. hurt, too much hate, you know, all of that. But there they were holding out a possibility for the country that had we listened, we would be 100 years ahead of where we are today. So again, Marty and I wanted to say, here's this man from, you know, unlikely circumstances, uh, elected to Congress, uh, writing these amazing, beautiful speeches about uh, justice and reconciliation that are still available in the congressional record, then okay. called the Congressional Globe. So okay. people who try to make the world better, you know, uh, kids can read those stories and get a sense that things were pretty bad, but, but they can identify with the hope of people who were trying to make a difference, you know? And so that's kind of, that's one of the things that we hope to do uh, with, and, and we hope we're not done yet writing these kind of books. Exactly okay. right. Thank you for that. I have a question in the chat um, and either one of you can take it. Well, there's two questions. So maybe I can give one to one of the ones. But <laughs> the first question is, what are your thoughts on the big controversy about critical race theory? <laughs> and what are your thoughts on the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Marty, you're chuckling. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you go first. Um, I don't know what Fry sees with the critical race theory. Um, of course, in uh, elementary school, you don't hear much about it. It's more in the middle and high schools. Right. And um, I feel that people are trying to suppress conversations about the real world and what's really yeah. happening. And um, you know, there's a lot of banning books now. And I think that adults don't, I think, it, this is my opinion. Yes, ma'am. I think right. that yeah. adults either don't want to um, talk about those conversations because they're very difficult to have with their children. Um, I think perhaps they don't know enough to talk um, without feeling ignorant about those topics. Um, you know, I, and so I, I think that's honestly what it goes back to. People don't wanna have those difficult conversations. And right. I think there's still racism out there and they, those, you know, who feel a certain way certainly don't want to open up what they might consider a Pandora's box of stuff that they don't want to answer. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> our, you know, our United States history is not my history, it's our history, it's your right. history too. Right. And we have to tell that story without whitewashing it. Correct, yes ma'am. Right. Can, I, can I jump in with, with sure. something there too? Um, mm -hmm. So we have, been to a lot of different schools. Uh, we've been to schools that were all white. We've been mm -hmm. to schools that were all black. We've been to schools that were racially mixed. Um, and, and we've talked about books that touch on the hard aspects of American history. Mm -hmm. And we haven't ever 
seen any little kids feel bad about themselves because they learned that at one point uh, white people own slaves. You know, if you're a little white kid and you and you're learning the story of Benjamin Sterling Turner, what they think I mean, and we know this because we've seen it. What they think is, wow, what a cool guy. You know, he was (laughs) he he persevered. He was brave. He was smart. Um, I want to be like him. I don't want to be a part of injustice. Um, And And slavery was wrong. It was bad. Slavery was wrong. And I mean that, you know, and so it really doesn't have the effect that politicians uh, try to say it does playing right. to the fears, the, maybe the honest fears of some parents, but it's mm-hmm. a cynical thing by so many politicians and they're just dead wrong. I mean, for one thing, um, I don't personally know anybody that's teaching critical race theory per se. I mean, I mean, maybe it is taught somewhere and that's fine. Uh, you know, people ought to know what it is. Most politicians who talk about it don't know what it is. Uh, But what they seem to mean to me is just not talking about the realities of America's racial history. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen over and over and over again is that if we do talk about it, um, we find that, you know, we share a certain sense of fair play uh, that that can generate goodwill and so we don't have to be afraid of this. I mean, it, it, it is not as hard as we sometimes make it, even though the subjects are tough. You know, I mean, there were some very harsh things that were done yeah. in this country historically. Yeah. Some harsh things continue to this day. Um, but there's enough goodwill out there in the land where people can talk about it if, if our cynical politicians didn't get in the way. That's my feeling about it and it's a and i've seen it i've seen it happen so and and i agree and i and i i hate politics that's that's what i call it because that's the thing (laughs) and and it it ruins everything and and ruins good things so yeah um, yeah i appreciate you all uh answering that question uh kind of veer it off but i want to come back to ezra wants to know the true story of the rosenwald school (laughs) <laughs> yes. yes. Um, because this this I thought was really interesting. Um, you know, I, I thought Mr. Washington and Mr. Rosenwald's collaboration was um, uniquely futuristic, if you will, for the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and Mr. Wo- Rosenwald's level of empathy at the time was definitely out of this world. But the thing that interested me the most is that Mr. Rosenwald had a stipulation for giving his seed money. Y'all wanna touch on what that stipulation was? Yeah, go ahead, Fry. He said that um, the local communities that were getting these schools had to match the money. Um, because he wanted them to have a stake in the schools. He, that, that not just that they received a new school as an act of charity, right. but that they helped pay for it, that they helped build it. Um, and that's what happened in case after case after case. These schools became um, uh, one of the focal points of community pride. And the interesting thing is, um, and a symbol of community achievement and community aspiration. And the interesting thing is that there's still uh, an effort today to preserve as many of these school buildings as we can, okay. because they remain a symbol of aspiration and pride and achievement and advancement. Um, and they're even on though, the National Register of Historic Places in many areas, and if they're not, if one is found, the community is always trying to make it make it that. Like okay. they're yes, they're being restored all over the place. It's wonderful. Sorry, awesome. Frank. Awesome. Yeah, no, I totally. And and so yeah, I that's Vincent, you you really hit on something there. You know, this was a this was a three way partnership. You know, it was yeah. Yeah. Booker T. Washington, it was Julius Rosenwald, but maybe even most important, it was the uh, the the African American men and women 
who wanted something better for their children, um, you know, all over, uh, all over the South in the most repressive parts of the, of the whole country. Right. You know, to me, I mean, I'm not African-American, but obviously, but I, uh, I'm, one of the things that fascinates me about, uh, about black history, uh, first of all, it's American history. It's interwoven. You can't, uh, you can't excise it from the history of the country in general. But the other thing is, it, it, it is not just the story of a few exceptional people like George Washington Carver or, you know, whoever, you know, people may have learned about in the past. It's not even just the story of oppression as bad as slavery was, as bad as segregation was, as, uh, you know, as bad as it is even now when, uh, when, when, you know, police brutality in a, in a uh, you know, a system of uh, a, a justice system that is not equal for all citizens. All of those things are realities, oppressive realities. But the other piece of black history that I think offers unique inspiration and hope for all of us is that the hope of something better just animated what African-American people did, how did, how did they hope for better? What, what kind of, what did, what kind of inner resources would you have to have to have hope when you were enslaved? And yet yeah. people did, you know, as soon as the civil war ended and slavery ended, you saw the, you saw African-American people freed the recently freed slaves, building churches, building schools, trying to build their own lives economically. I mean, you know, there was, it, there's this story of aspiration and hope and determination um, <laughs> that is just a human story yeah. that could be a uniting understanding uh, for everybody in the country if we just look at it. Yeah, right. absolutely. Very true. You made a lot of, a uh, lot of valid points there. Uh, our producer Penny was loving everything that you were just saying just now, so you definitely had an amen corner. Wife. Well, 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 I'm, well, I'm glad, and and uh, you know, it's one. I mean, that's just one opinion uh, of somebody who has, uh, you know, had the opportunity to 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 read about some of these things. I, I went recently. This is straying a little, but I went recently mm -hmm. um, to to Tulsa, Oklahoma on the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, which oh, none wow. of us were taught about when I was coming along in school. Uh, and there are museums there that, that capture that story as horrible and horrifying as it was. But the other thing that you feel just tangibly, palpably when you go there um, is the aspiration that produced Black Wall Street in the first place before whites attacked it uh, yeah. during the Tulsa massacre. And then that community came back despite that horrific massacre um, and then was damaged again by urban renewal and an interstate highway going through it in the 1970s. And it's come back again since then, you know, mm -hmm. so, so the, there are two parts to the story that were just so tangible and so present visiting Tulsa, Oklahoma. One was the horror of what happened and the other was that despite that, people kept trying. They refused to give up hope, you know? Yeah. And, and so there's inspiration to go along with the horror of that piece of our history. Yes, sir, mm -hmm. you're absolutely correct. And I like the way you worded that. There's inspiration to go along with the horror that happened in our history. You know what? Marty told me you was a smart young man. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. <laughs> I think she was absolutely correct. Um, <laughs> Except about the young part. <laughs> and, I, and I have to thank you all again. I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this conversation. I'm learning so much. Uh, you guys are giving great information about a man in uh, an event that many don't know happened. Um, and so again, I thank you for that. The book is Ezra Wants to Know the True Story of the Rosenwald School. Now, Marty, let me ask you this, because I asked about the, the stipulation that um, Mr. Rosenwald gave to the community. So what were some of the things that these communities did to help uh, raise money to go along with the, the project? Um, they had, a lot of them were farmers. So a lot of the 
farmers would create a special area and they would call them Rosenwald patches. So everything okay. they planted in those patches of land, they would sell those and all of the money that they received for those things would go towards the schools. Um, people gave their savings. People um, helped physically build the schools. They would give time. They would give um, materials. Um, they had dances at the school. They had box parties where um, at the churches, the women would make these cakes and put them in boxes and they would have um, lunches, box lunches that they would create. And then they would sell all of those and all of those funds that were made would go to the Rosenwald School Fund. Um, the other thing um, that we forgot to mention was the fact that the school boards had to give money too. Oh, really? Yes. And okay. of course, most of the school boards, well, all of the school boards back then were all white. Um, and so they had to give a portion of the money too, which they did. Um, and so, you know, between Rosenwald seed money um, and again, it's like teaching a man to fish, you know, you, you, they have to, you got your community has to come up with that money and the school board has to help as well. Yeah. Um, I think it all kind of worked together and uh, to create things. And then they would, you know, like I said, they would have dances and things like that. Um, uh, carnivals. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. It's they would do whatever they had a community affair to it, get it the was. money needed to help build the school. And I absolutely love that. I love that he did that to give them something to be vested in and to make mm -hmm. them a part of the entire thing. I think that's absolutely wonderful. Now, you just you mentioned that uh, people were giving their life savings and things to this project. And there was one piece in, in, the, in the book that I read where it said that a man gave his life savings to the project mm -hmm. and his life savings was a jar of pennies. Right. And that really, I don't know, for some reason that really hit me hard because it, um, it just exemplifies the fact that this guy from this particular generation donated his life savings so that the next generations could come up behind him and be better. Mm -hmm. And there's just right. something about that level of unselfishness that just sits right here in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the blood pumper, right here in my heart. A, all of those things in the book are real. Like when we yeah. interviewed people, that was a story we were told. Okay. That this man did it in their community. So the, the characters um, or all of the stories that Grandma Joy shared with Ezra, all of those things were true. Okay. Thanks. So that, you know, that's an important thing that people need to know when they're reading the story. We didn't make up all of those things that Grandma Joy told. Those were all from facts. Right. That we heard. Excellent. Good stuff. Now, do we know how many Rosenwald schools are left and where can people go to maybe visit some? Oh, um, there are not many left several okay. hundred and I think more are being discovered okay. um, and then there were schools that were not Rosenwald schools but they followed the same plans as yeah. Rosenwald schools so okay. that they came later but you know um, there are um, in Alabama there are still a few I'm going to talk about a few in Georgia and Fry you can go and tell about Alabama but there's one in Ackworth okay. here in um, in the Marietta area it's it's in Cobb County Ackworth there's one in Hiram Georgia which is not far from here okay. um, there's one in, called Noble Hill um, trying to think if there are any others but you know you think about just in this area very small area of Georgia that's three that I know of and I'm not sure I'm sure there are probably others um, okay but we went to some in North Carolina um, Fry you can talk about those and then in Flor and, uh, Florida in um, Alabama yeah, we traveled around to, um, you know, a half dozen schools where people had restored them. Uh, in many cases, 
uh, they were being used as as either museums or community centers or whatever. Okay. Uh, my uh, my late wife was principal of a school in in Charlotte that began as a Rosenwald school, and okay. the original building was on the school campus and was still used as a community center is today. And she made sure that they also had some kind of educational function in that building, you know, on a regular basis because she wanted to celebrate uh, the roots uh, of, of this elementary school as, as being tied to the Rosenwald, uh, you know, tradition. And so, you know, it, it varies from place to place. A lot have been lost, but, um, but you know, the fact that several hundred have been saved is, is encouraging and that that effort of preservation continues and making some kind of constructive use of these buildings, even if uh, they're too small to generally, you know, in most cases to generally continue as, as schools. Every now and then you find one in Mobile, where I am, uh, the Mobile County Training School was built as a Rosenwald school it still exists. It's still a school, um, uh, but uh, but that's the exception rather than the rather than the rule. So anyway, but it's an inspirational story, and it was uh, a great chance. Marty and I both felt to get a chance to write about it, and particularly for young readers. Well, I am thankful that you all did. I'm glad you all collaborated to bring us this wonderful book, this wonderful piece of history, even, uh, because this is definitely history. Uh, we, we've come to the end of our program. It's three o'clock, and I don't want to keep you all too long. I appreciate you all for uh, coming on the show today, for sharing the information that you've shared, and for just educating us. And that's what we're all about here at Conversations in Education, educating the masses, and make sure people never stop learning, okay? So my last question, my last question for you all is, uh, what has the experience been like touring for the book and is it being well received by the general mass? It is being very well received. Um, we were in Charlotte at the Charlotte Museum of History um, and had a, an audience, a jam-packed audience. And we talked about the book and there were a lot of great questions. Um, for I'm going to let you talk about our Alabama thing that we're doing because that's awesome. Um, and we've got some things that are, you know, going on. I've got um, hoping to have a few school visits, okay. not through Zoom, but face to face. <laughs> not through Zoom. I'm not through Zoom, but face to face. Um, very soon because the school year here it is it's almost april already you right. know yeah so but yeah it's been very well received excellent excellent Brian. yeah we were uh, we were at the uh, auburn university center for the arts and humanities uh, a few a couple of weeks ago and um it's a wonderful program uh that's part of the outreach at auburn university and um they brought in teachers and librarians and, um, and museum officials and others to hear our presentation. And then uh, now out of that, it looks like next fall, we're gonna be going around to a bunch of different places in Alabama to talk about the book and hopefully get it out to, uh, to more people and more schools and more libraries and more kids you know so thank you yeah. congrats yeah thank you thank, thank you, you very much you're very welcome sir thank you all this has been a pleasure i love learning okay because it i never you're never too old to evolve and to gain knowledge and wisdom okay and this has been from the moment i read this book to talking to you guys this has been i've just been soaking it up because you guys are amazing so thank you again the book everyone ezra wants to know the true story of the rosenwald schools see the there we go and uh it can be found on amazon prime correct right All yes right. sir and uh before i get to my scholar of the week i want to uh end with a couple of rosenwald business okay. <laughs> And this is, I took this from the book and I guess this was at one of the schools that they would say, good, better, best, mm -hmm. never let it rest. 
Until the good is better, and the better is best. Better is best. I absolutely love that. I'm going to incorporate that some type of way into the work that I do with these children because I absolutely love that. I'm going to say it again because I love it so much. So nice. I got to say it. Okay. <laughs> Good, better, best. Never let it rest. Until the good is better and the better is best. I love that. I absolutely love that. And then I have a quote from Mr. Julius Rodenwald himself. It says, all the other pleasures of life seem to wear out, but the pleasure of helping others in distress never does. Okay. Keep that in mind, people. When you're out in the community, you want to help the children, you want to help the community, uplift the community, keep that uh, quote in mind. All other pleasures of life seem to wear out, but the pleasure of helping others in distress never does. That is absolutely beautiful. And with that, I'm going to move into my scholar of the week, 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 week. This is the moment of my program where I acknowledge a child or children who is doing exceptional things in school or in the community. Okay. Um, so in the future, if you all have any of those excellent students, send them my name and I will shout them out on the show. But today we are spotlighting Mr. Elijah Presidi. He's 14 year old from Baton Rouge, and he is set to graduate with a physics with a degree in physics and chemical engineering in May from Southern University. Again, he's 14 years old. Wow. Okay. He is also a published author. You might need to talk to y'all. <laughs> <laughs> he's a multi patented inventor and a preacher who has made several appearances on national TV. Uh, Mr. Priscilli said that he wants to help show people what they're capable of. He also stated that, and I quote, well, I don't look for just breaking records. I look for changing lives. And in that, I will break records. My first priority is to be a shining light to help others. And the second priority is to make sure that I help people like me and people who want to connect with me. He's 14 people. Okay, so okay. give it up one time for Mr. Elijah Christine, my scholar awesome. of the week. Week, yes. week, week. So that wraps up our show for the day. You've been listening to Conversations in Education on WCEG Network. Thank you to my guests, uh, Ms. Marty Rosner and Mr. Fry Gellyard, the authors of Ezra Wants to Know the True Story of the Rolling Wild Schools. Go to Amazon.com and get it. Today, today, yes. all right. And with that, yes. we're going to say goodbye, farewell, and bid you adieu. Until next month, take care and be blessed. Peace. Peace. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>